Well, man, uh, yes, as uh, Devin mentioned, it is, uh, it is difficult to not be able to be together. But, um, but we, are, uh, we are listening, um, we are planning. Uh, no, we don't have a date yet, but, but we're t- keeping an eye on things, and, and we will gather soon, as soon as it is safe and, and the Lord leads us uh, to do so. so um, but we're excited that this morning you can be with us and that you can uh, just in enjoy this incredible time of worship. And uh, today we are in week five of our journey through the letter uh, of Ephesians. Uh, Paul wrote it to Christians who were in Ephesus. And so, um, and we're calling this series, Who Do You Think You Are? Because that really does matter. Who you think you are, who you believe yourself to be, will have a lot to do with how you live your life, how, how you encounter everything. And how you understand and how you react and interact with God. And so we want you to know who you are. In fact, one of the main reasons we call it this uh, is because the book of Ephesians, one of the main purposes is Paul is trying to tell people who are followers of Christ what it truly means to live in Christ. And that when you're in Christ, there is so much that's available to you. And he wants us to know who we really are as we live in Christ. Now, in week one, we discovered that we are God's chosen children, that we are forgiven, that we are adopted into God's incredible family. In week two, Paul reminded us that when we put our trust in Jesus and receive his Holy Spirit, that we are empowered. So who do you think you are? You are empowered. You are his chosen child. In, and then um, we, in week three, We found out that even though we were dead in our sins, that through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, we are made alive. Do you feel alive this morning? Maybe you need another cup of coffee. I'm not sure, but but really, we are alive because of Christ. And, And then last week, we discovered that when we put our trust in Jesus, not only do we become connected to him, but we are actually connected to the larger body of Christ We call that the church, and and the church is an incredible place. This means that if you are in Christ, you have a place where you belong. You have a place where you can engage, a place where you can be encouraged, and and you know what? We are better when we are together, And, and now, whether it's physically together or spiritually together, we can stay on mission, but I do believe this. I do believe that we are better when we can be together. And so we're, uh, we're excited to, to hopefully help, help have that happen soon. Now today we want to turn our attention to Ephesians chapter 3. So if you have a Bible with you, I hope you do, um, turn to Ephesians 3. If you need a Bible, you email the church. We'll make sure you get one because we, we want you to be able to be in God's Word. It is so important, especially in times like this. And so we're, now in, in Ephesians chapter 3, where Paul, he shares, how God radically changed his life and how when we know who we are in Christ, that Christ can help us live lives of confidence. Are are you living a life of confidence this morning? That's what I would like to ask you. And my hope is this morning is as we study God's word, you can live a life of greater confidence. So let's start in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Um, and, and, and it says this, he says, for this reason, <coughs> excuse me, um, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. Now, now there's actually a lot in this little opening statement. I mean, Paul was actually a prisoner, okay? He was a prisoner in Rome. He, and, and while he was locked up, some incredible things happened. I mean, it's actually good for us that Paul ended up in prison because it was during his time in prison that he took the time to write several of the books that we have in the New Testament, several of these letters to the churches that we can continue to read, we continue to learn from. And so it, it's actually a good thing that Paul ended up in prison. In fact, we can take a little note from Paul's life. Don't let a little confinement get you down because God can use this to do something great for his kingdom. Now, let's continue reading. He says this. He says, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation 
as I have already written briefly. So he actually says that there must have been some other letters written to them. Now, one of the things we want to notice here is this. He says, you have heard about this already. Now, Paul had already, he, he kind of started the church in Ephesus. He spent, we know, at least two years there. So the people knew of him. They'd heard his story. They'd heard his testimony. And Paul's about to elaborate a little bit more on his own personal testimony. And he says this. He says, in reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. He goes on and says, This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of his power. Now, that's a pretty incredible thing. And Paul's saying, hey, he's talking about this mystery, and we're, we're going to chat about that in just a minute. He goes on, he says, although... I am less than the least of all the Lord's people. I want to stop right there. This is really kind of interesting. Um, where he says, I am less than the least. Paul, um, he, he kind of makes up a word. He, it, it, this means, uh, if you were to really translate this out in, in, in English, I mean, I know they made it sound really nice for us. It, it would mean that I am the most leastest. Okay? It's just a superlative thing that just says, he says, man, I, I am just, I am lower than anybody else. I, I am at the bottom rung, and, which is pretty incredible for, for one of the apostles to say. But he says, you know, I am the least of all the Lord's people. Um, this grace has been given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past um, has kept hidden in God who created all things. Now, this is interesting. What, what does he mean? He says several times in this passage that this was a mystery. What, what does it mean that this is a mystery? I mean, w w folks, w when Jesus came the way he did, how he did, and what he did, uh, even giving his life on the cross, um, nobody in the world at that time saw that coming. I mean, the, last week we, in chapter 2, we talked about how there was this dividing wall of hostility. The, the, we looked at the, how there were two distinct, distinct groups in the world at that time. There were the Jewish nation, uh, God's chosen people, and then there was everybody else. And so you were either a Jew or you were a Gentile, and that was everybody else who wasn't a Jew. And, and that there was this hostility between the Jew because the Jews just said, hey, we're God's chosen people. You know what? We don't, we're not too worried about everybody else. Um, this is all about us. And, and so what's interesting is when Jesus came, the Jewish nation, and even though they were expecting a Messiah, they weren't expecting one like Jesus. They were expecting a Messiah that would come and who would literally, um, he, he, would, he would be their savior. He, he would liberate them. He would come to make Israel great again or something like that. I mean, the reality is, is that Jesus, though, he came not just to save the Jews, not just to liberate them from their sin and from their separation from God. He came to liberate us all so that we could all have a relationship with God. Now, um, in, in Acts chapter 9, it tells us of the incredible story of Paul's conversion from being a Jewish religious leader, yes, one of those people who, who didn't like Jesus, and, or at least how Jesus came, um, and, and he was persecuting Christians. He was even putting some of them to death. But how he, he went from becoming a uh, persecutor of Christians to one of the very people who was proclaiming Christianity. Now, folks, this, this is so huge. It's even hard to describe how, how huge this is. I mean, this would be equivalent to, well, like this would be equivalent to Nancy Pelosi becoming Donald Trump's press secretary or something like that. I mean, this would just be an absolute crazy turn of events that Paul, who was killing Christians, is now proclaiming Christ and telling people, hey, you can have this new life in Christ. And, and it tells us in Acts chapter 9, it tells us uh, what, what God chose Paul for. It says, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much 
he must suffer for my name. And we know that Paul really indeed did suffer for Christ's name. And, and so he was chosen for this job. And that's kind of this whole beginning of, of chapter 3. Paul saying, hey, you know I was chosen for this. This is why I'm doing this. Why? Because he was absolutely confident in his mission. He knew exactly what he had been called to do. He was called to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. And, and, and Paul wants all Christians to be confident as well in their mission. And, and so one of the first things that we find out here is that Paul wants us to be confident. And I, I want us all to be confident in our mission Okay, to be confident in what God has called us to do. So let's take a look at verse 10. Verse 10 says this. His intent, this is God, was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this was God's intent. Now it was God's intent that now. Everybody say now. Yeah, right there in your living room, everybody say it loud, now, right? Yes, now, not, not later, not before, just now. Now, it is God's intent that now, okay, this is the, the God saying, hey, this is when. He wants us now to do something, and, and, and he wants us to do it how? Through the church. You see, God's intent was that the, the church would be here to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to proclaim the message of the gospel, that all of the followers of Jesus would understand that we are called to be on mission for him. I mean, and so what, what is our mission? Our mission is the, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. Now, this is an amazing uh, uh, verse right here. This little word manifold right here, it's kind of a cool word. It's the same word if you were to translate it into Hebrew. It's the same word that was used of, um, you might remember Joseph, um, the, the guy who had the coat of many colors, you know, Je Joseph in the Technicolor dream coat. Yeah, well, this word manifold is this idea of multifaceted. It means it's got it all, right? And so what we as followers of Christ are supposed to do is we're supposed to make all of God's wisdom, just the multifaceted, amazing wisdom of God, we're supposed to make that known to the rest of the world. You see, that is our mission. Our mission is to make Christ known, to make God's mission known. And, and, and that's what it's really all about. And, and he has called all of us to participate. I mean, in the Old Testament, it was, it's like in the Old Testament, they were watching an old black and white picture of what God was doing. But now, now that Christ has come, we're supposed to be um, sharing an ultra high def, I don't know, 10K or however many Ks you can put behind it, um, ultra incredible picture, multi-technicolor picture of, of who God is and all that he's done. Now, and, and here's the point, that God wants the entire church, he wants all of us, all of us who are followers of Christ, to be involved in this. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're just, you know, in your home and we're, we're kind of in quarantine. And, and there's so many ways that we can make him known. There's so many ways we can communicate this to, to him. But he wants all of his people to be involved in the mission. He wants us to be confident in our mission to share the love of Jesus. How are you sharing the love of Jesus right now? Are you encouraging those around you? Are you picking up the phone and encouraging people? Are you, are you going for walks and encouraging your neighbors? Are you helping people who are in need, have food, get food or anything like that? Boy, that's what we're here for. We are to be on mission to share the gospel. In fact, the, the great British preacher, Charles Spurgeon, once said this, and I love this quote. He said, every Christian is a, is a missionary or an imposter. I mean, did you catch the, the strength of that? Every Christian is a missionary or an imposter. God has called every single one of us to participate in his incredible mission. Folks, if you're a follower of Jesus, you, are, you need to be absolutely confident. You can be absolutely confident in this, that God has called you to be part of his mission, his plan to redeem the world through sharing the amazing story of salvation through Jesus Christ. And we need to be confident in that mission. This has always been part of God's plan. Uh, uh, the verse there said that it was all about, oh, oops, sorry. Got to swipe differently there. It, it says that it was part of his eternal 
purpose. That, that this plan was part of God's eternal purpose. And, and one of the things we need to understand about God is this, is God always thinks with eternity in mind. All right? I mean, you might think about your, what, when you're thinking about your day, God is thinking about your eternity. When, when you're praying and you're wondering, like, wow, why, why isn't God answering my prayers the way I want him to or when I want him to? Well, here's why. Because God isn't just concerned about what's happening right now. God is concerned about the big picture of your eternity. God always acts and he always loves us with eternity in mind. And, and we should be thinking about others in light of eternity, with eternity in mind. And so when we look at people, when we look at neighbors, when we look at family and coworkers and other people, we should be looking at them going and say, hey, do they know the love of God? Do they have an eternity that is sure? Can they be confident in their eternal life with Jesus? And we are on mission to help make sure that they're confident in that. See, God is on a mission to save as many souls as possible, and he has invited you and me to be part of that mission with him. And, and while we're confident in our mission, we're also, as we're on mission, we have this incredible confidence that we can go to God for anything, that we can approach him uh, with anything that we need. So I, I'm confident in uh, to be able to approach God. In fact, uh, the next couple of verses, starting in verse 12, it says this, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Did you catch this? You can approach God with great freedom and with incredible confidence. And so Paul says, I ask you, therefore, don't be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. He's saying, hey, you don't have to worry about me. I might be in prison, but I'm still spreading the word. He's still writing these letters. He's still, the word is still getting out. And actually what's incredible is Paul's converting all the people, even the soldiers that, that were watching him while he was in prison. So he has this incredible confidence. He wants us to have that too. And we, have this, we can approach God with freedom and with confidence. I love watching my grandsons as they, approach, uh, as they come and approach me. You know why? They, they just, they just want to love on you. They just, and you know what? When they want something, they are absolutely free, and they ask confidently. They just say, hey, Papa, I, I want this. I want that. You know what? I love that. And, and we have a God who's an incredible father. He, he wants to give good gifts to his children. But remember, he always does this with eternity in mind. He knows what's best for us. He knows what's best for eternity. He knows what's best for others. And that's why he answers the way that he does. You know, it, it, this whole idea of approaching God with confidence reminds me of a, a great story that I heard that happened uh, during World War II. Uh, there was a soldier who's, um, who's in the Civil War whose uh, father and brother had both been killed uh, in battle. And he wanted to be able to go home and care for his um, uh, elderly um, and, and ill mother. Uh, but he kept being denied. He kept going up the ranks and, and asking could he go home. But, but he kept being denied. So finally while he was on leave one day, he, he made it all the way to the White House. And he gets up to the gates of the White House and he says, hey, I need to talk with the president. You know, he's taking his, he's taking his uh, plea to, to the top cause, right? So he heads to the White House, and he, and he gets turned away. He walks away, and he goes and he sits down on a bench at a park right across the street from the White House. And he's just wondering, what is he going to do? Is there any hope left? And, and this little boy walks up. And, and the little boy notices that the soldier is, uh, is, is being sorrowful, and he says, hey, what, what's the matter? And, and, and the, the soldier goes ahead and he tells him the story about what happened, how his father and his brother died. He wants to go home and take care of his mom and, and, and how he just, he just can't get anyone to listen. And, and he even got rejected uh, by, the, by the people at the White House and he can't get in to see the president. And the, the little boy says, well, I think I can help. And the, the, the soldier's saying, well, how, how can you help? And the little boy says, well, come with me. And he reaches up and he takes his hand. And he walks him right back over to the gate of the White House. And what's amazing is this time the, the soldiers, they stand at attention. They open the gate and they both walk right through. They make it up to the front door of the White House. And the, the guy who's there at the door, he opens the door and just kind of nods. And they both walk right in. They, they walk down the hallway past all these dignitaries. And, and, and they, they walk right into the Oval Office where, where President Lincoln is, is making plans for uh, the war with, with the Secretary of Defense and all of his other people in there. 
And he walks in and they stand there for a few minutes. And then all of a sudden the president looks up and he looks at the little boy and he says, well, good morning, Todd. He says, aren't you going to introduce me to your friend? You see, that little boy was Todd Lincoln, the son of Abraham Lincoln. And the reality to that story is this. When you have the son with you, you have access to the father. And when Jesus is living in our lives, we have access to the Father and we can approach with incredible confidence. And Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 says this. It says, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Anybody in a time of need right now? Whatever our need is, we can approach God with confidence. We can approach his throne and and, and we can say, Father, this is what we need. Father, this is what we we want you to do for us. And we can approach him with incredible confidence. Now, the the last section in chapter 3 is is a prayer. Um, and it's actually really three prayers, but, but, um, it, and it's there to give us confidence in God's power, in God's power to be able to do anything and everything. And, and so we want to start here in verse 14, um, and where, he, where Paul explains the source of the power. And he says this, he says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name. I pray that out of his glorious riches... He may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. He tells us where's the source of the power? It's through his spirit. It's through the Holy Spirit. And we receive the Holy Spirit when we put our trust in Christ. When we believe in him, we, we get the gift of God's Holy Spirit. And that spirit is working in us. I mean, I just worry that so many Christians don't live power-filled Christian lives, that, that so many of us are missing out on what God has in store for us. I mean, can I ask you something this morning? Do you believe that you are living fully in the power of Christ? If not, then, then we need to, we need to uh, pray like Paul is, that we would understand that, that the source is through God's Holy Spirit living in us, and that we, we would begin to grasp what that means. I mean, Paul prays for our followers of Christ to experience Christ-powered lives. And, and that's what he wants for us. He wants us to live uh, through the power of God's Holy Spirit. Then he goes on and he tells us the purpose of the power. What's the purpose of the power? He says, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, have power together with all God, the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. You see this? He wants us to be filled with the fullness of God. Well, how, what, what's the purpose of the power? It tells us right here. It's so that we will grasp the incredible love of God, how wide it is, how long it is, how high and how deep it is. That's what, the, we need power. Here, here's the thing. He, he says, and to know his love that surpasses knowledge. I mean, think about that, that sentence for just a minute, that we would know the love that surpasses knowledge. He's telling us, he wants us to know something that we can't fully know. We're gonna need some help with that. We, we, we can't do this on our own. We need the Holy Spirit's power to help us truly understand. So the purpose of this power of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to help us fully understand what the love of God. I mean, he's not there to, you know, just help us live through the day. He, he's here to help us have understand God's love and have power for eternity. He, he, he's there to help us. Yes, he's there to empower our day so that we can live our lives for him. But this power is given to us. The Holy Spirit is given so that we would grasp his love. How much are you grasping God's love this morning? My prayer is that today you'll spend time with him and you will grasp it even more. And guess what? No matter how much you grasp it, there's more to be understood today and tomorrow and the next day and for all eternity we will continue to learn about this incredible love of God in our lives. Now lastly uh, Paul says this he says that once we grasp 
this love, once we begin to understand this love that God has for us, then he says, then we truly become the conduit of that power. That now that God's power, his spirit is working with us and we're understanding how much God loves us, that we then become a conduit of power to the rest of the world. One of the things we say here all the time at Newberry Park Force Christian is we, we, we extend compassion. When we understand what God has done for us, we can't help but be a conduit of that power and of that love to other people. And, and this is how Paul says it, and this is such a powerful verse. He says, now to him... This is God who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. Can you imagine a lot? I sure can. According to what? His power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And can somebody say amen? I mean, he tells us this. He says there's this incredible power, okay, but it's not just your power, it is God's power. What's the source of the power? The Holy Spirit. What's the power there for? So we understand God's love. So what? So that we can be the conduit of that power. See, it's his power at work within us. See, that power there, it's not just there for us, it's for others. It's so that we can get this incredible message to others. And he's telling us, you know, that we let our roots sink deep into the love of God, and we become conduits then of this incredible power for others. Now, um, we aren't just passive spectators. We, we, we're not just, you know, of God's power, but we are participants in, in God's work. And his work is done with power, his power that's within each one of us. So can you imagine that? He wants to do more than you can imagine with his love working through your life. Now, how do we grow in this confidence? And well, we begin to understand uh, the source of his power. We, we uh, start to understand the purpose of his power. Um, and, and that is to grasp his incredible love, to live in his love, and to pass on his love to others. So how do we really grow in confidence? Well, the same way you would grow in confidence in anything, you practice you, you practice and you practice and you practice and, and you spend time every single day practicing. Uh, when I was growing up as a kid, um, I remember, man, I, I used to practice uh, playing baseball all the time. Just practice, 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 practice. And one time we did one of those little raffle things um, and, and I won this uh, special uh, Louisville Slugger baseball bat that every other kid in the league wanted to win and I won this incredible bat. And, and, and I started to believe, because I was using this bat and I just wanted to go out and practice every single day. I was in the batting cages. My friends are pitching. We were just hitting, 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 right? And, and, and so... Um, then one day, uh, the unthinkable happened. Um, somebody left the bat outside, and, um, and it was laying kind of in the, in the gutter, and somebody came to park at our house and, and ran over the bat and, and snapped it. And, and, and you know what was incredible? What was incredible is that I thought, there goes my, there, there goes my batting. I, I'm not, not going to be able to hit as well anymore because my bat was broken. See, the problem was I was putting my confidence in the wrong thing. I was putting my confidence in the bat, not the fact that, you know what, that with practice, every single day getting out there and just practicing and practicing, that that's really what could make you hit better. And the reality is if we want to experience this power that God has in store for us, if we want to experience and grasp the fullness of his love, then we're, folks, we're going to have to put this into practice. And, and I just see so many Christians who, who are missing out on the incredible power of God in their lives. Why? Because oftentimes we're just afraid. We're afraid to get out there and put our lives in a place where, where we really need God's power. Or, or maybe we're putting our hope, maybe we're putting our confidence in the wrong things. And the reality is, is one of the things about not being able to meet together that, that I'm looking at and thinking, you know, this is kind of good, is that it's teaching us that we don't just rely on being in a place we, we rely on the one who fills this place. We rely on his power that is with you at home, that's with you wherever you go, or go, and that power can't be contained by anything on earth. And that God wants you to learn to live in this incredible power. And this is a great time that while we're stuck at home to spend lots of time practicing the presence 
of Jesus Christ. Spending lots and lots of time in his word. Lots of time in prayer. Starting to just ask God daily to help you grasp his incredible love. And sometimes it just means just sitting there and just realizing and understanding and soaking in his incredible love for you and for me and for the rest of the world and even those who don't know him yet. And we need to be on mission to share that with everyone because God held nothing back in sharing his love with us. And, and that's why every week we, we practice, we, we, we have communion together. Um, we have communion because it reminds us of this incredible love. One of the ways that we grasp his love is we start to even let our minds get around the fact that Jesus came and died on a cross for you and for me. And so every week we, we take these, uh, these elements and, and we're reminded about God's incredible love for us. I mean, if you have the elements, why don't you make sure that everybody uh, uh, that's with you has those. And first, let's um, take this bread. You see, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, it says this. This is how we know what love is. You want to grasp God's love? This is how you know what love is. Christ laid down his life for you. Yeah, he gave up his life for you so that you could understand the fullness of his love. And so let's take this bread that represents Christ's body. Let's take that together. And then there's this cup. This amazing cup that represents God's, uh, Jesus' blood. His blood that he gave on our behalf to forgive us our sins. So that we could be filled with his Holy Spirit. And so that we could begin to understand and, and grasp and to live in his incredible love. And my prayer for you this morning is that as you take this, you will remember how much God loved you, how wide, how deep, how high, how long, how incredible is our Father's love for us. So let's take this cup together. And my prayer is as you understand his love, that you will learn to live in the confidence that comes with being an incredibly loved child of the Almighty God. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. We thank you for all that you are. We thank you, Father, for your incredible love that was displayed on the cross as Jesus went and as he, he took our penalty. Father, he suffered on our behalf. Father, so that we could live in his love and in his presence and that we could understand how great and how high and how deep and how wide the Father's love is for us. And Father, help us as you see things with eternity in mind. God, would you help us this week to see our neighbors, to see our world with eternity in mind? and learn to be true conduits of your love, your presence, and your power here on earth. We love you, Father. We thank you. Help us to live confident lives in your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.